Hey there, GED math students. Let's look at some sample GED math test questions. And you could see similar types of questions when you take the real test. Question one. Jill wants to get rolls of dimes and nickels for her dollars at the local bank. Each roll of dimes is worth $5. Each roll of nickels is worth $2. She exchanges $45 and receives 12 rolls of coins. How many of each type of roll of coins did she get? So basically, Jill went to the bank. She had $45 in cash, and she wants to exchange those for rolls of coins. Let's highlight some important information here. It says each roll of dimes is worth $5. This is a roll of nickels is worth two dollars and let's see she exchanges forty five dollars and she receives twelve rolls of coins now Right here it says she receives 12 rolls of coins. So the first thing I'm going to do is go through each answer choice and see if the total rolls of coins is 12. So let's start with answer choice A. It says there's four rolls of dimes and eight rolls of nickels. That's a total of 12 rolls, right? Four plus eight is 12. Let's just go to B, eight rolls and four rolls. That totals to 12. Eight plus four is 12. 5 rolls plus 7 rolls is 12, and 7 rolls plus 5 rolls is 12. So I can't eliminate any answer choices at this point. So let's continue. Now another important piece of information is right here. It says she exchanges $45. That tells me that when she gets her rolls of coins, the total worth has to be $45. In other words, let's look at answer choice A. If the four rolls of dimes and the eight rolls of nickels totals up to $45, then A is my answer. So how can I figure out the total worth of four rolls of dimes and eight rolls of nickels? Well, let's just go back up here. It says each roll of dimes is worth five dollars. Another way to look at that is if you have one roll of dimes it's worth five dollars. Let's just draw a quick picture of this so we understand it. So I have one roll of dimes. That's worth five dollars. Right? But it says we have four rolls of dimes so we have four of these. One, two, three, four. Each one's worth five dollars. So four rolls of dimes is worth five plus five plus five plus five, right? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Well, an easier way to do that is just take the five dollars times the four rolls, which is $20. So that's the quickest way to do it. You just take the worth of the roll, in this case the dimes, which is $5, and multiply it by the number of rolls of dimes, which was four. So $5 times four rolls of dimes is $20 plus the worth of eight rolls of nickels. Well, you can continue to draw a picture if that helps you. But what I'm going to do here now is take the worth of one roll of nickel, nickels, which is $2 times the eight rolls, or $2 times eight, which is $16. And when I add these two up, I get $46. 
Well, $46 does not match up with $45, so A cannot be my answer. Let's go to B. And here we have eight rolls of dimes and four rolls of nickels. So if I were you, I'd pause the video and try to figure out the total worth of that. Welcome back if you pause the video. So each roll of dimes is worth $5. So I'm going to take $5 times the eight rolls. $5 times eight is $40 plus each roll of nickels is worth $2, and $2 times the four rolls of nickels, i.e. $2 times four is $8. When I total that up, I get $48. That does not match up with $45. Let's continue to see. So let's see. $5 times 5 rolls of dimes. I'm taking this number times this. That's $25. Plus $2 times 7 is $14. That equals $39. That does not match up with $45. So D is my answer. Now, if I were taking the real test at this point, I would circle D and move on, but let's just make sure it's correct since we have the time. So let's see, it's $5 times 7 here, which is $35, plus $2 times 5, which is $10. $35 plus $10 is $45, and these match up. So in short, D is my answer because the total number of rolls is 12, right? We have 7 rolls of dimes plus 5 rolls of nickels, and 7 plus 5 is 12, which checks with this. And the total worth is $45, which checks with this piece of the puzzle right here, right here. Question 2. You scored 70, 84, and 92 on three tests. What do you need to get on the fourth test so your mean score is 80? Highlight and reread the final question. What do you need to get on the fourth test so your mean score is 80? Now I know my answer choices represent the score on my fourth test. Now the word mean indicates average. Sometimes on the GED test, they'll ask you to find the mean. Other times it might say the average. They indicate the exact same thing. Now, let's assume that the correct answer is A. What would that mean? Well, basically, it would indicate that if he scores a 66 on the fourth test, his average score overall would be an 80. In other words, if we take 70 plus 84 plus 92 plus 66 and divide that by 4 and we get out an 80, then A is my correct answer. So that's how I'm going to approach this problem. Before I jump into the math, are there any answer choices you think we could eliminate? I think it's tough to tell here. I'm going to go through each answer choice. So let's start with A. So test one, he scored 70, plus test two, 84, plus test three, 92, plus test four. We're going to assume he got a 66 on test four. So I'll put 66. And then I'm going to divide all of this by 
4 because now there's a total of 4 tests. 1, 2, 3, 4. Now when I punch this into the calculator, if I get out an 80, A is my answer. So let's do that. I recommend that when you're doing averages on the calculator that you use the fraction button. You're less likely to make mistakes. So I'm going to hit the fraction button right here. And then two boxes pop up. In the top blinking box, I'll just put all of this. So I'll put 70. You see it shows up right here. Then plus 84 plus 92 plus 66. Now I need to go down to the bottom, so hit your down arrow and type in a 4. Now you can hit enter at this point, but I always like to bring my cursor back to its normal position. So I'm going to hit my right arrow and hit enter. Well, if he gets a 66 on his fourth test, his overall average will be 78 and it needs to be 80. So A is gone. A is not a correct answer choice. So let me eliminate A. And now what I'm going to do is just assume that he got a 74 on the fourth test. So I'll erase this piece because I know that didn't work. And I'll say he got a 74. So I'll put plus 74 here. I'm now using answer choice B. So let me bring up the calculator again. And I'm going to hit clear. And when I do that, I'm just going to enter this new expression. I mean, this will basically be the same. The only thing that's changing is the 66 is going to become a 74. So hit clear. Hit your fraction button and type the top part in again with the 74. So 70 plus 84 plus 92 plus 74. Down at the bottom, hit your down arrow. Go to the bottom, put in a 4. You can hit enter here. That's perfectly okay. I like to get my cursor back to the normal position first, so I will hit my right arrow. Now, if I hit enter and out comes an 80, then B is my answer. Enter. It's 80. So that tells me if he scores a 74 on the fourth test, his overall average will be an 80, which matches up with what I want right here. So B is my answer. So in summary, if you score a 70 on the first test and 84 on the second test, a 92 on the third test, and a 74 on the fourth test, your overall average or mean is 80. Question 3. Gregory works as a basketball referee every Tuesday. One Tuesday, he earns $120 working three games. Another Tuesday, he earns $200 working five games. If Greg graphs the equation that would represent his total earnings based on the number of games worked, what would the slope be? So if I were to graph this information here, what would the slope mean in terms of this problem? That's kind of what they're asking, but let's make it more simple. Whenever you see the word slope with this type of problem, it's basically asking you the following. What are Greg's earnings per game or for one game? That's what our answer choices represent. In other words, does he make $10 per game, $12 per game, $40 per game, or $80 per game? Well, let's just go back to our numbers here and figure it out. It says if he works three games, he makes $120.
So would it make sense that he makes $10 per game? Well, if he makes $10 per game or for one game and he refs three games, $10 times three games would be $30. That's not enough money. So A is gone. I'll get to this piece in a second if I need to. Let's go to B. Would it make sense if he makes $12 per game or $12 in one game? I don't think so. If he makes $12 in one game, in three games, it would be $12 times three, which is way less than $120. So B is gone. And you'll have access to a calculator for this. What about C? Does it make sense if he earns $40 per game? Well, let's see. If he earns $40 in one game, in three games, it would be 40 plus 40 plus 40, or 40 times 3, which is $120. So that checks out. That piece checks out. In other words, what I did is I went $40 for one game times 3 games, and 40 times 3 is $120. But let's check it for this one to be sure. It says here, five games he makes two hundred dollars so forty dollars in one game so forty dollars times five games yep forty times five is two hundred so c is my answer question four multiply the quantity 2x minus 1 times the quantity x plus 1. Now if you're good at algebra you can use the FOIL method to do this or the box method and there's other methods but if you're not good at algebra I'm going to show you a way around it. So when I see variables or letters in my question and variables or letters in my answer choices I like to use the plug-in strategy. Basically, what I'm going to do is pick some random value for x. Usually for problems like this, I let x equal 2, 3, or 4. In reality, you can use any number you want to. Another note is I usually stay away from 0 and 1. So for this particular problem, I'm just going to say let x equals 3. And the reason I didn't pick 2 is because... We already have a 2 in here. But you could use 2, it would work, and 3 smaller than 4, so I think this is just the best choice, but you could also use 4 as well. So we're going to say x equals 3. So what I want to do is plug in 3 for x here and here. But I'm going to show you how to do this on your calculator to make life easier. So, let me bring up my calculator. I can store 3 in for x. Let me show you how to do it. And when you use the storage feature, you actually punch this in backwards. You punch in the 3 first and then the x. So watch. I'll type in my 3 right here. And I want to store it with x. Here's my storage button right here. I'm going to hit that once and an arrow pops up and then my X button's right here there's a whole bunch of letters here just hit this once and this is how you read this 3 is stored with X that's how it shows up on the calculator it's backwards from this when we do it with pencil paper we say X equals 3 these mean the same thing and if you notice, the arrow here kind of replaces the equal sign. Now, once you have it just like this, don't forget to hit your Enter button. And this is what you're going to see. 3 with the arrow X, and then after you hit Enter, you'll see 3 again. Now you're set to go. The value of 3 is stored with X on the calculator. Now watch what I'm going to do. I can punch this in exactly how I see it. So I'm going to do an open parenthesis right here. I'm going to go 2x, 2, and x. And your x button is right here. Just hit this button once, and x pops up. 
minus, that's this button here, one, close your parenthesis right here, and then do an open parenthesis, and now I'm going to do x plus one. Here's your x, shows up here, plus one, close your parenthesis. Now I'm going to hit enter and I get out a 20. So when I punch this in, I got out 20. I'll write that down. This is my target answer. In other words, when I punched in 3 for x here and here on the calculator, I got out a 20. I'm going to bring my calculator back up. Now, I'm going to clear this out so it doesn't get messy. And it's very important to understand that when I hit the clear button, it doesn't mess with the storage feature. X is stored with 3. That won't change. So just hit clear. Everything's like it was. X or 3 is still stored with X. Now I'm just going to punch this in 2X squared. Watch. 2 X right here. Just hit this button once. Squared. Here's your squared button. Now hit enter. And we get an output of 18. That does not match up with my target answer. So this output was 18. My target answer is 20. This is gone. Now we'll go ahead and do B. I'm going to clear this out. I'm going to punch this in 2x squared minus 1. So 2x squared minus 1. I'm going a little faster here. I just punch this in. Matches up with this. Hit enter. My output 17, but my target answer is 20. So this came out to be a 17. That does not match up with my target answer. This is gone. Let's go to C. Let me clear this. I'll punch this in. So 2 x squared, right here, here's my squared button, minus or subtract, that's this button right here, x, so I'll hit this button right here, minus 1, minus 1, make sure this matches up with this, hit enter, and I get an output of 14. That does not match up with my target answer of 20. C is gone. At this point, I circle D and I move on. But since we have time, we're not taking the actual real test. Let's just check D to make sure it works. So I'm going to go 2x squared plus x minus 1 a little quicker. So 2x squared plus x minus 1. Hit enter and check it out. I get an output of 20. And that matches up with my target answer right here. So D is my answer. Let me show you the traditional way to do it for those who want to know. I actually, when I'm taking a standardized test, prefer this method. But everyone's a little different, so you choose. Here's the algebraic way of doing it. I actually use an area model or the box method. I don't use the FOIL method when I teach this traditionally. And I make a box and section it off into four pieces. At the top of the box, I put the 2x minus 1 as follows. I put the 2x here and the minus 1 here. So 2x minus 1 shows up here. And then x plus 1 I put along this side. So I put the x here and the plus 1 here. So this is my x plus 1 from here. Then I just multiply it out. It's like a times table. So I'm going to take x times 2x is 2x squared. Then I take x times minus 1 is minus 1x. And if you think about it, what I really did is I said this length is x and this length is x. Let me say that again. If this length is x, this length is x, and x 
times minus 1 is a minus 1x. And I do the same thing here. I take this plus 1 times 2x, which is 2x. So basically I said that this length is 2x, this length is 2x, and I multiply the 2x times 1, which is 2x. And then this here, this area here is going to be minus 1. I just multiplied plus 1 times minus 1, which gives me this. Again, you can look at it this way. If this length is plus 1, this length is plus 1. This length is negative 1, this length is negative 1. Plus 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. And then I can combine the diagonals here because they're like terms. So I'm going to add the, these two pieces right here, this and this. So watch how I do this. I'll bring down my 2x squared. I'll combine these two. 2x plus a negative 1x is plus 1x. Just added these two to get this. And then I bring down my minus 1. You do not need to show this plus 1. And look, we get d as well. So either way I do this problem, my answer is D. Question 5. A phrase is shown four times the sum of a number n and 3. Which expression represents the phrase? So which one of these expressions matches up with this phrase? This is a translation question. The first thing I notice in my phrase is I have four times right here. And it's four times some stuff. This is my stuff over here. So I'm going to use the process of elimination. If it says four times some stuff in my expression, I'll keep it. If it says something else, I'll get rid of it. So let's look at A. This says four times some stuff, and the stuff is in plus three. There's a time sign here, it's not showing. So I need to keep A. B says three times n plus four. The n plus four is the stuff, but it's all multiplied by three, and it needs to be multiplied by four, so B is gone. What about C? Should we keep it or eliminate it? Well, we need to keep it. It says 4 times n plus 3, or 4 times some stuff. I need to keep it. What about d? We can get rid of it. It says n times 3 plus 4, or n times some stuff. It doesn't say 4 times some stuff, so d's gone. At this point, with a problem like this, I would probably guess A or C and move on. But we have time, so let's narrow it down to the final answer. So let's reread this phrase. It says four times the sum, which means addition, of a number n and three. This is what throws students off, is this piece right here. A number n. So you know what I want to do? I'm basically going to do what I did in the last question and pick some number for n. Remember, we can pick any number we want for n. I try to stay away from 0 and 1. And I see a 4 here and a 3 here. So how about if we say n equals 2? I will cross this out. And instead of having a number in, I'll just put a 2 here. Now look at how much easier this is to read. 4 times the sum of 2 and 3. Well, what do you think that is? Just based on the phrase, we have to do the sum of 2 and 3, which is 5. Remember, sum means addition, so I just added the 2 and the 3. Then it says 4 times this, or 4 times 5, which is 20. And this is my target answer. I believe that was the same target answer in the previous question. That's a coincidence. So now what I'm going to do is go to answer choice A, and I'll replace the N here 
with 2. So I'm going to rewrite this as 4 parenthesis instead of in I'll replace it with 2 plus 3. Now you could enter this in the calculator. You don't need to use the storage or button or anything. Just enter it as you see it. But let's do this by hand. Remember the order of operations PEMDAS always says you have to do the operations within the parentheses first. And the operation within the parentheses is addition. So I need to do this piece first. And 2 plus 3 is 5. And then I bring down the times and the 4. Well, what's 4 times 5? That's 20. That matches up with my target answer. So my answer is A. Let's just look at C so you can see why it doesn't work. Again, I'll plug in 2 for N right here. So I have 4 times N. There's a time sign there. Again, N is 2. So I'll replace, put a 2 here, plus 3. Well, there's no parentheses here, so according to the order of operations, PEMDAS, I always do multiplication. Not always. Uh, let me just say, for this expression, I do multiplication before addition. So I'll do the 4 times 2 first now. And 4 times 2 is 8. Bring down the plus 3. And that gives me 11, which does not match up with the target answer. So you can clearly see that C is not the correct answer. Well, thanks for watching. Have a great day.